personal favorites, the value equation, which was championed by Porter, another Harvard uh, professor, advocacy, racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I really can't lay enough accolades um, to Dr. Persley, but I can say it's my honor and my pleasure to introduce Dr. Dwayne Persley as our speaker today for the Billy Andrews Lectureship. Well, uh, thank you, <laughs> Scott. Uh, uh, that's that's uh, more uh, than I deserve. Um, so and that was fascinating because if you really think about it, it's true. And I'm going to uh, attempt to share my screen here. Okay, and I hope. Uh, you all can can see uh, my uh, title slide there. Are we good to go, Addy? Yep, looks great. Thank you so much. Great. Well, I I am pleased and honored to have my name added to a, a really impressive list of prior invited speakers for the Billy Andrews Lectureship at the University of Louisville and Norton Children's and. In a way, I feel like I walked into the wrong wedding reception. That's a really impressive list of, of people who have given uh, talks in, in Dr. Andrew's name. It, it's also a pleasure to participate in the institution that's birthed some of my favorite colleagues in the profession. And it starts with you, Scott, a national leader who's worked in teaching in the business aspects of neonatology has benefited uh, scores of NICU medical directors around the country. Uh, it includes David Adamkin, uh, who's provided really significant insights into so many areas of clinical neonatology, uh, particularly neonatal nutrition, and who's spoken at my invitation to our Harvard Regional Conference. Uh, uh, David's another friend. And finally, and more recently, um, Kim Bowen, who I met as a member of the AAP National Nominating Committee, uh, responsible for vetting nominations for both AAP president and at-large board members. Uh, I mean, Kim taught me so much in her organized and impactful contributions as committee chair over the last year. So uh, my talk, I, I think as Scott implied, is probably quite different from the lectures of the past, of, of at least the first 15 years of the Andrews lectures, where the focus was largely on new clinical science. Um, the mold, however, was probably already broken when you had Mark Del Monte, uh, AAP CEO and another friend, speak to you a couple of years ago, and I'm sure Gotham gave a thoughtful and stimulating address last year. I'm going to talk about neonatal care, but I'm going to focus more on the opportunities than the successes. Um, and despite my public health training and an early focus on social disparities and infant outcome, in fact, I don't consider myself either a bona fide health services researcher or, in, or implementation scientist. I also don't have specific training in anthropology, sociology, or other social sciences, many have focused their careers on ethnic studies, but I'm not one of them. I do have a lived experience, and this has shaped my views on health equity inequities and provided personal context in my efforts to improve equity, diversity and inclusion in medicine, pediatrics, and perinatal care. Um, I've been around for a long time and have worked with a number of uh, entities, so I've been fortunate to have had opportunities to comment and in fact change at my hospital network and medical school uh, through some service on foundation, uh, academic and government panels and through contributions in organized medicine, including the AAP, the, the Board of Pediatrics and the American Pedi Pediatric Society. Um, uh, and uh, apart um, from this, um, I have nothing to disclose. Um, so, this could be the topic of a full day workshop, but today I'll focus on the following areas. Uh, I'll review recent evidence relating to health equity and quality improvement in newborn care. Uh, there's been much published in the last four or five years and it's worthy of review. I'll provide a brief review of racism as a social determinant of health and the opportunities for anti-racism efforts. I'll focus on the NICU, but there's certainly um, transferable to other uh, areas of pediatrics. And I'll identify strategies to incorporate health equity uh, into 
quality improvement efforts. And here I'm going to focus on change strategies, and I'll focus particularly on family engagement, which is an area a bit less evolved from our usual suite of process and outcome measures and quality work. And, and, and again, importantly, particularly for the last two objectives, there are opportunities that translate into general and subspecialty care of children beyond infancy. So um, what do we know? Um, we know uh, that there's been an impressive trend in infant mortality in this country. Uh, in fact, in 2018, uh, infant mortality rate declined 2% from the previous year to fewer than 5.7 deaths per thousand live births. This is the continuation of a long trend um, with rare exception of infant mortality reduction in our country. And the decline in infant mortality in this country is one of the most dramatic declines in age-specific mortality ever uh, recorded. We know that um, infant rates vary geographically within the country. When we see variability intuitively, we see this as an opportunity to improve. So Kentucky falls into one of the middle tiers here, and I know that there are ongoing efforts to get it into the gray. But those of us um, in the gray and blue shouldn't get cocky. Um, we realize that race and ethnicity are significant contributors to infant mortality and that the distribution of race and ethnicity in our states is a major contributor to interstate differences as our poverty and rural rurality. So this can blunt our optimism regarding those opportunities for improvement. We know that infant mortality declines can be affected by two major factors, reductions in gestational age distribution, that is fewer babies born at gestational ages with high mortality risk, and reductions in gestational age specific mortality, fewer babies dying at gestational ages with high mortality risk. So reducing preterm birth or providing better care to either improve the condition of the baby at birth or improving the care provided to the newborn are the major opportunities to reduce infant mortality and risk for short and long-term morbidity. We know that preterm birth rates actually increased uh, 2% in 2019. They were higher for both black and white, um, uh, for both black and Hispanic um, uh, mothers relative to white mothers. Um, and elevated rates persist for both early and late preterm uh, gestational ages. Um, excess prematurity in both the early and late phases contributes to prematurity. And although there was significant improvement in late preterm delivery with the elective delivery guidelines, Historically, early preterm rates have been difficult to move, particularly in the earliest phases where mortality is much higher and uh, substantial disparity exists. Even though babies born early preterm are more likely to die than late preterms, you have to account for the fact that there are a lot more late preterms delivered compared to their early counterparts. So how does each gestational age group contribute to infant mortality, infant mortality reduction, and infant mortality disparity? So over the seven year period in this analysis here, gestational age is in the first column, followed by the distribution of infant mortality reduction in the total population, then non-Hispanic white, non-Hispanic black, and Hispanic uh, percentages. An absolute decrease in infant mortality for each population is at the bottom. There was a 14%, that is 0.8 deaths per thousand live births, overall reduction in infant mortality. That was the greatest um, for non-Hispanic Black uh, women. There was a reduction in the contribution of gestational age to infant mortality occurring for each racial and ethnic category at almost every gestational age. The exception was here for non-Hispanic white women at 32 to 33 weeks. The distribution in gestational age rate reductions differs by racial and ethnic category. 
Non-Hispanic black women were primary beneficiaries at early preterm and non-Hispanic white women benefited at early term. For all babies, these reductions in infant mortality have occurred primarily because of re reductions in gestational age specific mortality. That is babies are dying at lower rates at each gestation. And this outstrips our ability to prevent them from early delivery. In this chart, in the first column, 69% uh, of the infant mortality reduction was attributed to gestational age specific mortality. The gestational age specific mortality reduction occurred at the same rate for non Hispanic black um, infants in the third column and was even higher for Hispanic. Um, uh, infants in the fourth column. So taken together, the last two slides suggest that NICUs and high-risk obstetric care play a key role, not only in infant mortality reductions, but also in the reduction of infant mortality racial disparities. Why high-risk obstetric care, you might ask? Well, survival in a NICU relates to condition at birth. In my department, the late Doug Richardson, using the SNAP and ENTIS scores, um, illness severity scores he developed showed that mortality reduction reflected NICU survival, but he also showed early preterm babies also were delivered with greater physiologic stability as reflected in their SNAP scores. We can't take credit for the condition of the baby at birth. Our community has um, contributed substantially to the health equity literature in the last five years. I think it's useful to review this recent evidence. Adjusted um, in, in, here uh, in adjusted preterm uh, neonatal morbidity and mortality differences by hospital, Liz Howell, an obstetrician uh, who's now the chair of obstetrics at the University of Pennsylvania, looked at morbidity and mortality for more than 7,000 very preterm babies born in New York City hospitals and documented substantial variation in risk-adjusted neonatal mortality and significant morbidity. And, and morbidity, that's quite significant. Bronchopulmonary dysplasia, severe necrotizing and colitis, stage three or higher ROP and grade three or higher IVH. And she did this by a hospital. So these are New York City hospitals listed by rank according to their adjusted neonatal mortality and morbidity rates where a baby was born seemed to make a huge difference. Here, um, race and ethnicity is in the first column, followed by data on low, middle, and high uh, morbidity and mortality hospitals. Focus on the distribution of race and ethnicity in the last grouping here. Looking at the distribution of births across the race and ethnic categories, you can see that non-Hispanic black in the first row uh, here and Hispanic uh, infants in the second row were more likely than non-Hispanic white infants to be born in hospitals with the highest risk standardized rates of morbidity and mortality represented in the far right category. There are substantial differences in outcomes within hospitals, but the differences in hospital birth explain 40% of the black-white disparity and 30% of the Hispanic-white disparity in outcomes. So it appears like several maternal measures that outcome disparities exist both within and between hospitals. Substantial improvements could be attained if the lower performing hospitals were brought up to average. So what are the factors that explain these differences? Large clinical databases like the Vermont Oxford Network have provided more insight into the outcomes and specific practices that might explain these differences in morbidity and mortality. In this study, using the California Perinatal Quality Collaborative Monitor Tool, which examines nine process, uh, processes and outcomes reflected in the list here overlying the chart. 
in California, NICUs with at least 10 admitted um, African-American babies meeting criteria, Yoakum Prophet was able to demonstrate significant racial ethnic variation in care quality. Here, higher scores are better. Blue dots are uh, non-Hispanic white and red dots are non-Hispanic black. Again, this occurred both between and within NICUs. Relative to white infants, black and Hispanic infants scored lower on these practice and potentially modifiable uh, outcomes. Here's a plot looking at differences between Hispanic represented in green and white represented in blue, infants for the monitor subcomponents. And in this example, Hispanic infants were less likely to be receiving human milk at discharge, to have benefited from antenatal steroids, to re receive timely eye exams, to avoid hospital acquired infection, and to exhibit high growth velocity. There's evidence that we're moving in the right direction. Also using the Vermont Oxford data set in a cohort of more than 200,000 infants, 22 to 29 weeks over 12 years, Bogosian here demonstrated a decrease over time in racial and ethnic disparities in several care practices and outcomes. The detail in these curves is less important than the overall patterns. These are outcomes with black patients depicted in red, and Hispanic patients in blue relative to the majority population depicted by the bottom lines, uh, by the uh, dotted lines here. Compared with white infants, African-American infants had a faster decline for mortality, hypothermia, necrotizing enterocolitis, and late onset sepsis, whereas Hispanic infants had a faster decline for mortality, respiratory distress syndrome, and pneumothorax. Given the improvements for several care practice measures and potentially modifiable outcomes, this reinforces our belief that quality improvement initiatives targeted at the disparate practices are important. Jeffrey Horbar and colleagues sought to determine the extent of segregation, that is the unequal distribution of race and ethnic groups across NICUs and inequality, that is the concentration of race and ethnic groups in lower quality NICUs in the care of very low birth weight and very preterm infants across more than 700 US NICUs over three years, again, using monitor scores. So these Lorentz curves make me dizzy, but they examine race and ethnicity in US NICUs ranked by the proportion of white infants from highest to lowest. And the cumulative population percentages of white and minority infants are plotted. Basically, if all NICUs had the same racial or quality distribution as the overall populations, the curves would fall on the diagonal dotted line. That the fact that they don't indicates that NICUs are segregated by race and in ethnicity to the greatest extent for white, uh, excuse me, for Hispanic and black infants. So segregation is one thing, but inequality is the operative um, is the operative factor. So here's the bottom line: there's evidence um, already that we've seen in New York City and in California, but now we have evidence for it in over 700 NICUs in the country, compared with white infants. Black infants were concentrated in lower quality uh, NICUs, and interestingly. Hispanic and Asian infants were concentrated at higher quality NICUs. These columns look at NICUs with five levels, with five levels um, of, uh, uh, of monitor scores from those uh, with the highest scores to those with the lowest scores uh, on the right here. Uh, and they demonstrate that black infants are more prevalent in lower quality NICUs. So segregation explains where infants receive care, but not why black infants receive care at lower quality NICUs and Asian infants receive care at higher quality NICUs than white infants. 
what are the social demographic factors and the public policies that affect hospital quality, hospital access, and the choice for minoritized women and their infants? Herein lies the concern of residential segregation in the country resulting from structural racism. There are many effects, economic well-being, education, health, and healthcare. And the roles of racism and bias in healthcare inequality deserve investigation. Regional policies on access and referral patterns for pregnant women and their infants may have an impact. Not every state has policies supporting financial reimbursement for neonatal or maternal transfer, and that may um, present as a barrier. States have widely inconsistent policies on criteria for levels of NICU care, a barrier to monitoring regulation and standardized care provision, and there are inconsistent policies governing access to and the payment for high quality OB, perinatal, and neonatal care. And this may also play a role in quality uh, disparities by race. We gained substantial um, insight into some of the struggles encountered by racial and ethnic minority um, uh, NICU families through accounts captured in Krista Sigurdsson's qualitative study. In this study, she describes and characterizes disparities in NICU quality of care through narrative accounts of family advocates and clinicians, nurses, physicians, nurse practitioners, and others. Here you see examples of suboptimal care, and those are broadly described as neglectful care, judgmental care, and systemic barriers. Think about these for a bit. Can you envision that these behaviors occurring in your own unit? I certainly can. And I'm guessing that we can also relate to the privileged care example. You know, ideally all of our parents should feel like they're receiving privileged care. You should note that language barriers cut across and impact all types of disparate care. And we often see isolation, delayed care, misuse of and inadequate translation services and other effects. Supportive families with limited English proficiency is a key equity issue uh, in our NICUs. And regretfully, accounts included lack of sympathy for opioid uh, dependent mothers or absentee families, lack of accommodations for cultural needs, and overt racist treatment of families of color. Some were assumed to be violent, difficult, or at fault for their life experiences, as opposed to majority families given more leeway in displaying a variety of emotions and behaviors. So disparate care can be experienced by families as well as infants. The account suggests that families, racial and ethnic, social, financial, cultural, and linguistic characteristics may influence interactions with NICU providers and the care of their infants may suffer as a result. So now you've seen several studies documenting racial and ethnic disparities in NICU care. Dr. Sigurdsson helped pull some of this together in a systematic review of the literature documenting racial and ethnic disparities in quality of care for infants in the NICU setting. And her team uh, reviewed more than 400 abstracts and distilled those down to 40 articles, meeting some predefined criteria that depend, that identified disparities in one of these three categories of measures. So structure, among other factors, uh, this emphasizes the critical role of nursing management and culture. Um, research from Vaughn has found that nurse patient ratios and nursing work environments make a big difference as do higher rates of missed nursing care and recognition for nursing excellence, such as through magnet status. Process, uh, this includes several practices and actions that potentially relate directly or indirectly to improved outcomes. Breast milk is associated with reduced neck rates. Surfactant non-invasive respiratory support may help reduce respiratory morbidity. Kangaroo care, shared decision-making, family experience they all may affect discharge readiness and the confidence and incompetence to provide optimal post-discharge care. And then outcomes, a whole host of disparate outcomes have been documented, um, uh, including necrotizing intercolitis, IVH, hospital acquired infections, mortality and respiratory conditions. 
So there are a whole host of potential opportunities to reduce disparate care and outcomes. And these are outcomes that generally disadvantage infants of color. And given the studies we reviewed, they may reflect differential quality of care or access to high quality care. Uh, and differential disparities may require different strategies. If we standardize practices and consistently apply them, you know, we really should be able to observe differences in the outcome space. And this is also true for many of the process measures. Parental satisfaction and family experience and the shared parent provider decision making are important factors to address. And doing these well can help ensure uptake of other practices. So this is where we are. NICUs continue to play a key role, not only in infant mortality reduction, but also in the reduction of infant mortality, racial and ethnic disparities. There are persisting racial and ethnic structural process and outcome differences that reflect and affect differential outcome um, in both morbidity and mortality. Racial and ethnic disparities are seen both within and between hospitals. And there's evidence of inequitable care toward families that may in turn affect the care and outcomes of their infants. So we've seen numerous examples of disparate processes and outcomes. So how and why does this occur? And I'll start off the section by making note of an upcoming publication that will provide I think a great overview for anti-racism in neonatology with a host of potential concrete approaches. Recently, uh, your own, uh, recently, um, Diana uh, Montoya Williams led a tour de force effort to summarize principles of racism uh, and concrete approaches to anti-racism work. And the following um, three slides, I think are well covered uh, in this review which is due for publication in January or February. So why do these gaps uh, occur? Um, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Healthy People 2030 report, social determinants of health are the conditions in the environment where people are born, live, where they learn, where they work, where they play, where they worship and where they age. And uh, these uh, determinants affect the wide range of healthcare, health outcomes, functioning and quality of life outcomes and risks. Generally, social determinants are grouped into the depicted domains, economic stability, education, healthcare, environment, and social and community context. Now, social determinants don't imply racial or ethnic differences. This is an important point. The problem, of course, is that the distribution of these social determinants among the population is not random. Instead, social, economic, and political systems distribute these determinants inequitably across the population. Black and indigenous um, uh, people of color are more likely to experience reduced access to health care receive care in lower quality hospitals, as we've seen, live in neighborhoods with more risk and fewer resources, have more exposure to environmental uh, pollutants, be over-criminalized, and have diminished access to employment and wealth opportunities. The inequitable racialized distribution of social determinants in our country highlights the prominent role of racism as a key factor in, in social determinants of health. Finally, race, is a social construct and has little evident basis in genetics or biology. Race emerged as a concept when European explorers encountered individuals in the new world and sought, and sought to establish a human classification system defined by physical appearance and skin color to structure essentially hierarchies of power and consolidate that power in the dominating group. As noted, um, by the evolving classifications of race in the U.S. Census, race is neither biologic, genetic, or natural, but instead evolves and responds to social political forces that continue to reinforce and normalize that, that hierarchy and dominance over all other groups. Racism refers to the discrimination, marginalization, or oppression of people of color 
through the use of policies, ideas, and actions that differentially structure opportunity, behavior, and risk for non-white infant individuals. And there are several types of racism that have been described. Um, and here is one framework. Structural racism are the ways in which societies foster discrimination through these mutually reinforcing systems of housing, education, employment, earnings, and such. Similarly, institutional racism refers to processes of racism that are embedded in laws, in our policies and practices within societal institutions. Think here of Jim Crow laws. Interpersonal racism refers to personally mediated prejudice, assumptions, beliefs, and discrimination, as well as differential behaviors and actions based on race. And interpersonal racism can be un unintentional, as we many of us have learned through recent training. As a result of racism in all its forms, racial and ethnic inequality, inequities, um, unexplained by genetic associations, uh, exist in perinatal and neonatal health and healthcare, and we reviewed several examples of this. Studies have begun to explore how the inequitable distribution of social determinants of health as a result of racism explains these inequities. And listed in the pyramid figure here are a number of strategies we've identified to counter the four classifications of racism. The NICU, um, uh, in many ways, is an ideal opportunity for anti-racism work. And I'm, I'm uh, always um, pleased to be able to share this news with my colleagues in neonatology. It's uh, particularly well-suited for anti-racism work for several reasons. First, racial and ethnic disparities in fetal and infant health outcomes have been well described for decades and both have a major impact across the lifespan and contribute to lifelong health inequities. Many social determinants that are concentrated in uh, our marginalized communities affect the risk of preterm birth and low birth weight, which in turn drives disparities in infant mortality in the population. Mitigating racial and ethnic disparities in perinatal and infant outcomes uh, requires an understanding of the downstream pathophysiology that leads to preterm labor, that leads to preeclampsia, poor fetal growth, and infant death. Neonatologists, other neonatal healthcare professionals, and obstetric providers have exten extensive clinical and academic expertise in these pathophysiologic processes, as well as the care of fetuses and newborns that can potentially be leveraged to ensure the validity of research questions and those interventions that aim to address these infant health uh, disparities. Racially uh, minoritized families face disproportionate exposure to the NICU setting, um, given the high rates of preterm birth and low birth weight in these communities. And having an infant in the NICU can cause significant parental stress and trauma. However, that stress is uh, also compounded by other ongoing stressors related to socioeconomic status, financial insecurity, interpersonal discrimination, and other social determinants. Finally, the NICU experience occurs during a critical phase of infant development, as well as the development of the parent-infant relationship. Given the existing and increasing knowledge about the impact of early life adversity on neuroendocrine, immune, metabolic, uh, and epigenetic processes, anti-racist interventions in the NICU have the potential, the potential to improve long-term health trajectories for patients and families. And this is especially true if interventions employ an equitable follow-through approach that recognizes the responsibility of us uh, professionals NICU in the NICU towards addressing social determinants for infants beyond the NICU walls. The NICU stay is really an opportunity to intervene on systemically racist structures, institutionally racist policies, and interpersonal instances of, uh, of bias that may be affecting these families. So how do we bring this discovery and knowledge to our daily practice? So no matter uh, our role, and again, this can be applied 
to areas uh, in, uh, in healthcare uh, outside of the NICU, no matter your role, whether you're providing direct care serving or, or serving as an administrator, conducting research, engaging in quality improvement work, teaching, or you're working in the community, there are opportunities to contribute to anti-racism work. Specific examples are cited in the review, but um, here I'll focus on a few basic strategies, particularly with starting engagement. So here's a, a starting list. Um, marginalized populations aren't either inherently advantaged or disadvantaged. Outcomes largely aren't predetermined, but are potentially modifiable. We need to keep that in mind. Potentially modifiable directly or indirectly by what we do. So there was a time when policymakers were unburdened, if you will, by the contentions that these outcomes reflected genetic differences. There's little evidence for this. And further, the disparities appear largely modifiable. Influence staff diversity whenever possible in hiring and participation. Families find great comfort in seeing and interacting with staff who look like them who speak their primary language, who understand their cultures. Their perspectives help inform every aspect of care delivery. Include equity as care, uh, as a care quality factor, similar to other quality domains, safety, uh, effectiveness, timeliness, patient-centeredness, uh, efficiency, um, channeling the IOM recommendations of the past. Consider intervention quality as well as presence. You can look at timeliness of surfactant or antibiotic administration in the NICU or comprehensiveness like uh, social determinants of health screening, um, uh, which is um, much more uh, advanced in our um, primary care settings than they are in our hospital settings. Include balancing measures when relevant. Um, so in, in neonatology, in our zeal to avoid uh, admission hypothermia, let's make sure that we don't overheat these babies. Examine sustainability of our effects. In a Massachusetts quality collaborative process uh, project, there were no racial and ethnic differences in breast milk use initially, but it wasn't sustained until discharge, an important factor. Establish family care uh, centered care standards and develop measures to track the compliance with these. Identify outcomes as well as processes in family engagement. It's fine to track family meetings, but there are other opportunities. Uh, here in my hospital, we use a survey tool to look at several domains, confidence, continuity, coordination, environment, um, participation, support, uh, information. Um, and we also look at discharge readiness. Ensure diverse representation on family advisory groups. Give families of color a voice in formulating our, our policies. Ensure that infants within systems are receiving risk-appropriate care. This isn't an issue in some states where there are promulgated standards as well as incentives for risk-appropriate care. In others, there's a little, there's, there's not much guidance in defining risk-appropriate care and standardizing NICU uh, levels of care. Recent um, work primarily focused on outpatient adult care has emphasized the benefits of patient-physician concordance on clinical care outcomes for underrepresented minorities, arguing it can ameliorate biases, it can improve communication, and can increase trust. And in this study, um, the authors examined almost 2 million hospital births in Florida over uh, more than 20 years and found that newborn physician racial concordance was associated with a significant survival advantage for those um, um, babies of color. The results suggested that these benefits manifest during more challenging births and in hospitals that deliver more black babies. So could the factors relating to families in part account for the findings in this study? I think um, there are really substantive benefits in diversing, diversifying our workforce. And there are much more um, research that needs to be um, uh, undertaken in this area. 
the California Perinatal Quality Collaborative has su suggested um, 10 ideas in these categories to improve family-centered care for diverse families. And they range from ways to establish an equity cultural norm in the unit, acculturating families to family-centered care, improving family communication, conducting assessments of family unmet needs, invoking strategies to improve family leadership and developing targeted family education. And you can find this very easily on the internet. Um, in unit acculturation, signaling the importance of uh, family-centered care, you know, multilingual line, uh, signage, welcoming families, ensuring families are greeted and treated respectfully. Um, uh, in NICU staff communication, offering uh, opportunities for families to interact with their babies in care teams and ways that work for them in person, by phone, virtually, whatever it takes. Um, uh, ensuring um, that we are offering appropriate language assistance. In counseling, employing personnel for a standardized assessment of families' social determinants of health and for tailored psychosocial support. Using organizational resources to provide routine social services screening for all families at the beginning of their hospital stay. Um, some NICUs have employed paid family advisors uh, and our family advisory council for input on issues of NICU care and have recruited diverse families that are representative of the families served. Developing targeted multilingual and culturally appropriate education and support for families on the health benefits of breastfeeding and preterm infants. Developing standard, standardized multilingual and culturally appropriate education on touch and kangaroo care and ensuring staff is properly trained and educated on their value. The hope is that this high level family engagement will assist in our ability to ultimately address the potential factors underlying these disparities in the hospital, but more importantly, beyond the hospital. All of those factors are associated with poverty. Effects that impact um, families while in our NICU and have significant effects on the growth and development of our graduates. Uh, the NICU again offers an opportunity to start to mitigate some of these effects early in the life of these vulnerable infants and families and hopefully alter their life trajectories. Meg Parker, a, a DNA tologist here in Boston at Boston Medical Center which is a safety net hospital that largely serves marginalized populations, offers suggestions on how we can best uh, assist families uh, in our NICU. And this is really hard. Addressing short-term needs through universal programs, looking at their basic needs can result in added stress and anxiety for families uh, with NICU babies, including food, parking, uh, and transportation, childcare, mental health support using screening tools for longer term unmet needs. Um, and this is again, really challenging, but even um, uh, more challenging and relying on screening tools administered by the NICU or hospital staff and community partnerships, which can evolve because many of these community programs um, uh, have uh, fairly um, short lives and there can be a fair amount of turnover developed uh, depending on the funding available to them. But we need to be aware of the community programs who can provide support um, for our patients after discharge. Family navigation of social services, social workers, case managers, generally pretty com uh, fully committed to mental health assessments, social supports, to sort of concrete services uh, and other more immediate needs. Um, some uh, units have found peer support to be an effective um, uh, uh, ancillary uh, to um, the, the in models that assist with navigation. There's no standard for NICU screening uh, in mental health support, but surveying, um, uh, surveilling for NICU related stress and anxiety, as well as for postpartum depression is important. It's important for all of our patients. Coordinating efforts with high risk infant follow up programs. Again, there's currently no formal standard for high-risk follow-up. You've got a good program there um, at Norton's and the AEP Committee on Fetus and Newborn is currently reviewing this need and is likely to 
put out a new policy statement in the near future. Uh, social determinant health screening has been commonly employed in the pediatric outpatient setting. And in this study, Meg um, Parker again performed a mixed method study in two safety net NICUs to determine how often unmet basic needs were assessed and identified among 600 NICU families. Um, they, they were able to find that except for employment, other unmet needs were infrequently assessed. That included housing, food and hunger, child care, transportation, uh, whether their utilities were, were on and active. In focus groups, the staff concluded that the processes to assess weren't standardized, uh, unlike a lot of our care practices, and they were inconsistently performed, uh, or at times uh, inconsistently documented. Last year, I had an opportunity to collaborate uh, with uh, a number of um, uh, neonatologists and pediatricians to outline the causal pathways of increased risk, lower quality care, and economic, social economic disadvantage through which racism, segregation, and inequality adversely impact short and long-term outcomes and suggest some basic and more advanced responses. Um, uh, so, We've already discussed, I think, examples of differences in care quality. We haven't said much about increased risk because much of this risk relates to care prior to delivery. As, as you're aware, non-Hispanic Black women and Hispanic women are at increased risk of preterm birth in our country. And we know that these disparate risks, as well as the risk of infant mortality, are strongly associated with social determinants. Um, you know, interventions to improve the quality of prenatal and interconception care, increase interpregnancy intervals, assure access to 17 hydroxy progesterone, ensure surclage placement uh, in the appropriate high risk women, and screen and treat specific infections have had mixed success in addressing the gap, and hopefully more understanding is, is, um, is forthcoming. And finally, uh, you know, in social economic disadvantages in infant and childhood, infancy and childhood, the effects don't stop at preterm birth and infant mortality. I think less appreciated is the fact that this risk extends beyond birth to influence later outcomes. Preterm birth, preterm babies born to low SES mothers um, are at extremely low gestational age or very low birth weight, compared with their more advantaged counterparts, at a greater risk of poorer health and long-term neural developmental uh, deficits. These are the family provider touch points, at least in perinatal care through the early life cycle that offer opportunity for improved engagement care and potentially even clinical research engagement. Um, for the NICU, the opportunities begin well before admission. And in Americans in general, trust their practitioners, generally viewing medical professionals favorably. And when possible, working for us in neonatology and engaging in, in the context of obstetric care provides a sense of assurance that's difficult to attain during a hospital admission. In the appendix of our article, The Carol Keller of Health, we provide several potentially better practices for follow through. There's a total list of 62 organized along the same outcome. The term follow through may be preferable to us to distinguish the support from follow up, which is focused on medical conditions and neurodevelopmental uh, assessment. And here are the other general categories of examples of potentially better practices for follow through. There are several proposed interventions for health professionals, multidisciplinary care teams, and healthcare organizations to remedy the adverse effects of race, racism, segregation, and inequality, as well as research uh, priorities. Um, yeah, and it, you know, I'm not sure how useful in general a list, a large list of these practices is, but for many of us, it's at least a place offers a place to start. So beyond care improvement, there are other opportunities to improve perinatal health equity through advocacy. And this is particularly true in academic and organized medicine. It's even true at Harvard Medical School where there's been impressive sustained success to maintain a diverse student body over the years. 
And this hasn't been accompanied, unfortunately, by successes in maintaining the pipeline in our training programs or in our faculty. Uh, the diverse and women faculty who are present are frequently called upon to, con to contribute to diversity, equity, inclusion efforts. And until recently, these efforts had no academic currency, uh, but now they do. Um, there's a significant supporting activity that is part of the promotions process that is considered uh, in faculty promotions. Um, I worked on a task force to develop an equity, social justice, and advocacy award to recognize individuals and groups at the medical school who advance uh, these areas. Contributions that affirm uh, the mission of the medical school, uh, the community values of the medical school, and medical professionalism. Health equity and social justice advocacy, whether it's directed at our patients, at our practices, at our institutions, our society, are inherent in medicine's professional ethos. The National Academy of Medicine identified equitable as one of the six domains of healthcare quality and defined the aim of equity at the population level to include improving health status in a matter that reduces health disparities. Many may be familiar with the AP Equity Agenda or the American Board of Pediatrics DEI Action Plans. If not, I would encourage you to review them. They're doing some really good things in those organizations. So this brings me to Billy Andrews and the legacy he's left in neonatology. And it reminded me of the legacy of Will Cochran, who's my predecessor here at Beth Israel, an important mentor to me and role model for a NICU staff. Um, Will passed away last week at age 98. He was revered uh, here at Harvard. He was the person who coined the term blueberry muffin baby after he overheard the conversion of conversation of two phlebotomists who had obtained a blood specimen from a baby with a torch infection in the NICU. And he was one of the many physicians called upon to consult on Patrick Kennedy, the third child born to John and Jacqueline Kennedy uh, when he presented with respiratory distress syndrome. Billy and Will, they have the same formal name, shared many traits. They were members of the lucky few generation. Um, some refer to it as the silent generation. They were born eight years apart. They were both military officers uh, who ably served our country. Will was a fighter pilot. Both were uber accomplished academic leaders and significantly both clearly recognized the importance of our role in supporting and nurturing our high-risk babies to help ensure that they would have the best chance of enjoying healthy lives. At the same time, both recognize the important role and responsibility of society and child health and well-being. Billy's Children's Bill of Rights says it all, affording uh, the newborn the very best environment, nutrition, and opportunity for growth environment and, and development. Um, proper shelter, nutrition, clothes, education, and health measures be provided each child. As a society, making every effort to establish for the children of today a firmer footing than we have ourselves enjoyed, and fully realizing the level of civilization attained by any society will be determined by the attention it is paid to the welfare of its infants and children. Societies are judged by how they care for their most vulnerable. So we're, while reviewing the Billy's Children's Bill of Rights, I noticed that it was published on May 19th, 1968. That was about 16 weeks after the death of another member of the lucky few generation. In fact, someone whose birth almost falls at the midpoint between the birth dates of Billy and Will. It's important for all of us to be aware of, identify and respond to health disparities in medicine. All of these activities re represent substantial opportunities to alleviate suffering and improve the health and well being of the sickest, smallest, and most vulnerable of patients. All of us are engaged in healthcare, but our goal is to optimize health and well being for all babies. We need as much as possible to extend ourselves for that to occur, and we need to extend our support to families. We need to do what we can to send them from the hospital with the best chance of achieving the optimal goal. Thank you.
Thanks so much, Dr. Bursley. This is Julia Sparks, um, Addie's co-chief, but I wanted to make you aware of a couple questions and comments in the chat. Dr. Schickler, I think on your slide about um, comparing the New York City hospital data, he was asking about those being public or all hospitals in NYC. Um, that's a great question, a, a very um, actually commonly asked question, and those hospitals have not been identified. Um, I think the natural suspicion is that for whatever reason they're under-resourced, um, um, but um, you know that that uh, 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 that you know I, I think we can all sort of see examples of where there's actually quite good care that's undertaken in some of our safety uh, net hospitals, um, and I think at the end of the day, it, it it's resources, you know, ensuring that uh, the staff has what it needs to do to provide what we would think would be basic um, uh, and and basic expected care for these babies. Great question. And then we have a comment from Dr. Boland. She said, thank you for the sex presentation and she appreciates some of the very practical and thoughtful ways to approach making changes to achieve equity in our patients. Thanks, Kim. It's good to hear from you. Thanks, Duane. I appreciate your being here today. Thank you. Dr. Persley, uh, I have a, a, a question of practicality and wonder about what you've done. We've noticed in our groups, uh, when we've had underrepresented uh, family members uh, participate in our group discussions at our away meetings, uh, they've been underrepresented members, but they're all economically well off enough to be able to travel, leave their families behind and come to our sites. So we've started having uh, more electronic Zoom meetings so that people who don't have the finances or the child support care can still participate as family advisory folks. Are, are you doing anything like that at your uh, hospital? We, we absolutely are. Uh, it, you know, the pandemic has uh, brought many innovations uh, and, and this is one of them. Um, it, it really is democratizing uh, to be able to provide um, that video option uh, for, as we refer to them here, families that work for a living, um, you know, and, um, you know, like a, a number of family councils are in fact founded or supported by um, departments of development. Um, and those are for explicit purposes. And we've kind of taken over and repurposed ours um, uh, because we think that there's great value in having uh, the input um, and having diverse input into our practices uh, here. And it takes a, an effort to make um, our, our meetings accessible uh, and to make them comfortable uh, in our meetings and to ensure that they understand that we value their feedback. Um, but that it's, I, I think use of virtual technology has a great, um, a great place. The other um, uh, thing that we've discovered is if you offer off hour meetings, uh, that can be helpful for folks as well. Dr. Parsley, it's Scott Duncan. Um, I know it's after nine o'clock now, and but I wanted to stop and to thank you personally and professionally for this talk. Um, I hope you caught my comment in your introduction that I bumped into you in a basketball court. That's an important <laughs> comment to me. <laughs> but, your, your presentation, is, as always, was thoughtful and it's very, very timely. Um, I've, I've delivered a grand rounds probably about a year or so ago with one of the obstetricians on the inequities in maternal and infant outcomes. And much of what you touched on today were at least partially component of that talk. I think one of the things that we do a really lousy job with is in mental health support and assessment. And in fact, I've had one of our uh, pediatric uh, psychiatrists come and do a different grand rounds on just that very issue. Um, and I wonder, you know, in, at least in my own mind's eye, we don't have a, a typical screening tool that we use 
but I think it should be something that we should think about and develop into how much that would actually help with some of the other social determinants of health. Not only are there screening tools for that, but there are now ICD-10 codes and CPT codes that address social determinants of health. Are, are you doing anything formally with uh, mental health evaluations? Not enough, Scott. Um, thank you for your question. It, you know, this is the, the song that plays over and over again, um, and certainly our primary care colleagues um, can, can attest um, to the important need to integrate behavioral health into our clinical practices. Neonatology is no different. Um, you know, these are, this is a, a stressful an experience uh, a family uh, might have. Uh, have a baby in a neonatal intensive care unit. So we've got to be really mindful uh, of the stresses, the impact of those stresses, not only on the family during the time of the NICU hospitalization, but, but beyond. Um, you know, they need to go home um, to their families and their families need to be in a sufficient state uh, to have the confidence and the confidence to take those babies home. Um, so uh, yeah, it, it, you know, I, I could talk for a long time about this because I really am concerned about the paucity of um, specialty providers in this area, certainly in um, behavioral and developmental medicine, there's, um, there's a real uh, subspecialty shortage um, there, but it's gonna fall more as I'm sure my primary care colleagues would attest to us generalists, and, and Scott, I consider us age-based generalists, to be um, uh, more um, skilled and experienced in providing some of the support um, uh, and then complementing that with expert support um, in those areas. But yes, having a standardized instrument would be a great start, I think, in our NICUs. Um, Addie, do you have anything else to add before we wrap up for the day? No, I think that we're all good. We just had a couple more uh, comments from people thanking you, Dr. Persley, and very appreciative for the presentation. So thanks again. Addie and Julie, thank you very much for your <laughs> technical support. And I'm, I'm sorry I went longer than I intended here, but uh, it, I guess I had a lot to say, but it was really a pleasure to be able to, to speak to your group this morning. I hope everyone has a great weekend. Thanks so much. Everyone have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.